Good morning and welcome to our most important program, the criminalization of Islamophobia studies. I'm John Esposito, founding director of the Prince Al-Wali bin Talal Center for Muslim Christian Understanding and director of the Bridge Initiative, protecting pluralism, ending Islamophobia. Our presence is in the Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. A major contributor to this organization and content of our program today is Mubashra Tazamal, my colleague and the associate director of the Bridge Initiative, who unfortunately could not be with us today. Over the past few years, a number of European governments, especially those led by right-wing or right-leaning parties, have taken aim at academics and activists who call attention to the state's discriminatory policies against Muslims. Scholars who have produced important work analyzing the state's role in promoting and supporting Islamophobia have been subject to smear campaigns accusing them of being tied to extremism and terrorism. In November 2020, for example, Dr. Farid Hafez, who is on our program today, at his home and at 60 homes of, of other Muslims, they were targeted by Austrian authorities as part of Operation Luxor. It was later revealed that the Austrian government targeted Dr. Hafez due to his scholarly work on Islamophobia. Following the two-year battle, the charges against Dr. Hafez were dropped as they had no legal standing, but the long-standing impact of the raid illustrates the increasing hostility academics and Muslim civil society are experiencing in Europe. In France, organizations like the Collective Against Islamophobia have documented the rising hate crimes against Muslim communities, have been shut down, but they've been shut down by the state and many others continue to face intimidation and harassment by the authorities. The Bridge Initiative brings together a panel of experts who have faced targeted harassment for their scholarly work on the state's role in promoting Islamophobia. To discuss this growing dangerous phenomena and the impact it's having on academic freedom and civil society. Our speakers today are two outstanding and leading scholars and experts on Islamophobia and the criminalization of Islamophobia studies. Dr. Francois Bourgat is a political scientist and Arabist, <clears throat> former senior research fellow, director of research at the French, <coughs> excuse me, at the French National Center <coughs> for scientific research. Posted at Irmam in Aix-en-Provence. He's the former head of the French Center for Archaeology and Social Sciences in Sana'a, in Yemen, and of the French Institute in the Near East in Damascus. He's also been the principal investigator of the European Research Council research program. When authoritarian is when authoritarianism fails in the Arab world. His latest books include Understanding Political Islam and the history of Islamist mobilizations, 19th to 21st century, from Afghani to Baghdadi. Buga is also a member of the European Council on Foreign Relations. Dr. Farid Hafez is a Vienna-based political scientist at Salzburg University, Department of Political Science and Sociology, and currently a visiting professor at Williams College in the US. In 2017, Fareed was a Fulbright visiting professor at the University of California, Berkeley, and in 2014, a visiting scholar at Columbia University in New York City. He is the founding director of the German-English Islamophobia Studies Yearbook since 2010 and co-editor of the annual European Islamophobia Report since 2015, a collaborative work with 40 scholars covering more than 30 European countries. Hafez regularly appears on prominent media outlets throughout the world. He was awarded the prestigious 2010 Bruna Kriski Award for Pol a Political Book of the Year for his anthology of Islamophobia in Austria. Hafez has more than 100 publications and publishes in internationally renowned journals such as Politics and Prejudice, German Politics and Society, Religion, Oxford Journal of Law and Religion. 
He's also a senior researcher in the Bridge Initiative. So I'll turn it over now to Francois Bourgard. John, I want to, to thank you. I want to thank you before all Bridge Initiative, Georgetown University. Uh, you know, the, the, the idea is that um, in front of the situation we face in France, I sometimes say that we, uh, uh, we ought to relay upon international pressure. You know, it's been for quite some time that uh, the French would be asked to support human rights in North Africa uh, or in, uh, in India. And, and now I think that the time has come that um, first of all, we, we might, uh, we the French ask uh, uh, US support in the field of human rights. And even I was uh, recently uh, like in Turkey or other countries around the world. And I, I was uh, as a joke, but not completely a joke. I say we need, uh, we need uh, foreign pressure uh, to help us move beyond this situation which we face in, in France. What is it, the situation we face in France? You, uh, John, have mentioned the, the worst of what we have been uh, going through. It is when um, a fringe of the academic uh, apparatus, uh, uh, a fringe of our colleagues, hand in hand with the more and more rightist government, uh, extend the focus of legal criminalization of Muslims. And you have mentioned what I consider the worst, and I wrote a paper, I said, France has moved beyond the red line of leaving, moving away from the state of law when they have dissolved the collective for uh, struggle against Islamophobia. So this is where we are. So in, in these minutes, like, like 15 minutes to come, I would like to uh, 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 briefly dissociate the, what I consider the, the historical roots of this situation uh, and, and the most recent developments linked to an affair which is not which has not really crossed the Atlantic, you do not know, but linked to the, the publishing of a book about uh, a, a month and a half ago, which has accelerated, nothing new, but has accelerated dramatically this uh, drift toward more radicalism of 85% uh, of the press and of the government and of the opposition, uh, hand in hand. Um, so uh, before this, we will hear, uh, but it, uh, we, we know that there is a common denominator in this situation in Europe, but there are specificities. So allow me to, uh, to give a, a kind of French touch uh, of our Islamophobia. <laughs> the French touch is that First of all, there is a terminology to segregate between Muslims and not Muslims, which are concerned by the struggle against Islamophobia. Uh, the, the, we have a, a specific terminology, which is islamo uh, You have in front of you one of the symbols of islamo uh, islamo gauchism is a terminology which has been created in 2006. It is important. It is not the main door to enter in the phenomenon. It's an international door, regional door entrance, but it is uh, significant. In 2006, there was a war between the, there was the NEM war uh, between Israel and Gaza. And a tiny fringe of French intellectuals did not buy uh, the uh, discourse uh, of, uh, of Israel criminalizing Hamas, ideologically criminalizing Hamas. Uh, uh, depoliticizing the occupation and, and promoting the idea that there was violence in the Middle East because Muslims were too much Muslims, because Palestinians were Muslims. And um, a French intellectual by the name of uh, uh, Pierre-André Taguieff wanted to criminalize the fringe of the French intellectuals who supported the Palestinians or who denied the right of Israel to criminalize uh, the uh, Palestinian resistance. So he say they, the left, they are basically from the left and they support Islam, uh, read terrorism. Hmm? So it's Islamo-Gauchism. This is how was created the word Islamo-Gauchism, the non-Muslim who supported Palestinians during the 2006 war. Of course, this is not the main entrance to the phenomenon, but it is a, a nice compartment of it the strong voice of the state of Israel wants to criminalize Muslim activism, 
whether in the Middle East or in every single European society, it communicates, okay? But this is not, this is not the, 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 the main historical uh, roots of the phenomenon. Very briefly, let me tell you why I consider that the main root is not the rivalry between dogmas. It's part of it, you know, France considers it's Christian and it sees um, Islam moving in and it says, oh, oh, oh um, we are Christian. But why do I consider that this is not the main uh, reason for, for two uh, points? The first is that the, 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 the believers, the Catholic believers are not the most violent nowadays against Muslims. They have, they share a lot and John knows this, they share a lot in common. So very often the most violent voices against Muslims do not come from Christians. They came from hardliners, secularists. Okay, let's move. And, and the second reason, of course, is that France can no longer be described as a Christian country. It's a de-Christianized country. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a country where less and less citizens care with religion. So let's forget the, the rivalry between dogmas. Let's move to our specificity, our secularism the French style secularism, which comes, which uh, is the heritage of the um, 1789 uh, situation where the revolutionaries found themselves in front of an institution, the church, which was a tool in the hands of the king, absolute power. So they decided that the church would no longer be allowed in the public sphere. This is very French. This is very French. This is our specificity. So sometimes you hear this very vicious discourse. We have nothing against Islam. We are against religion in the public sphere. It happens that it is Muslims, but you know, it is just the fact that you are a religion. We oppose not Islam, but a religion which intends to exist in the public sphere. This is not the real root cause. Let me come to the third to which I consider the main root cause. Let's remind us that the encounter between the French and Islam during two centuries was linked to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Since Napoleon until uh, early post -world, Second World War, Islam, Muslims, they were people far away from us. They were in their own lands and we were in a situation of hegemony over them inside their own society, thanks to colonialism, okay? After the Second World War, there is a revolution. We used to build cathedrals in their capital cities of Algiers or Tunis. They started due to the end of colonization, due to the very voluntarist immigration policies bringing in millions of workers to help reconstruction. They began to be the Muslim. They started being French citizens asking for the right to build mosque in the suburbs of our cities, okay? So if I want to make it really short, I will say that the, this tension with Islam is not a religious tension. The heart of it is not the religious tensions. It is the sons of the colonized, no, the sons of the colonizer refuse to accept that the son, the sons and daughters of the colonized ask for the, raise their voice, ask for their rights. What do they ask for? Two kinds of rights. They ask for the rights linked to their nationality, to their citizenship to be implemented. Okay? And they ask, this is a lot more vicious, they ask for the right to participate in the writing of history of their relation between the land of their ancestors and France. And this is very touchy issue, okay? Why does it happen now? Why does it happen only since, let's say 10 years? Because the first generation of the colonized, they did not even know how to speak. The second generation, they didn't know how to write. The third generation, they were very weak in terms of communication. But listen, the fourth and the fifth generation, nowadays, they have the ability, they have the capacity, they know how to write, to speak, to communicate, 
And this is what the French society is refusing. The core of all this blah, 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 Islamism, blah, 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 frerism, blah, 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 uh, fundamentalist. If you go to it, you will find that it is an echo of the decolonization. And uh, at least the French, we shall see that there is probably nuances in the Anglo-Saxon world, even though, even though there is some of this. Uh, these societies refuse, and, and let me give you an, an example to support this thesis. If the descendants of the colonized are not of a Muslim culture, if they come from sub-Saharian societies which are not Muslim, their demands will be exactly in the same way criminalized, not as Islamist, but as racialist, racialist. When, when, when black people ask for the rights of black minorities in France, they are discredited as being against universality. You know, they, they support uh, minorities, racial minorities uh, point of view. Um, so to, to wrap this up, uh, I have wrapped this up. Let me move in five minutes to uh, this phase of acceleration during the last three, four years. In 20, in early or late 2019, President Macron has realized that if he wanted to be reelected, he had to mobilize the extreme right. After the, the yellow jackets uh, uh, riots, he knew he could no longer mobilize the center or the center left or even the center right. He had to move to the extreme right. So in October 2020, he adopted the rhetoric which had for 30 or 40 years been limited to the extreme right. He adopted the, 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 the extreme right Islamophobia became the state Islamophobia, became the Islamophobia of the state. And now when I want to, to uh, um, wrap it up, <laughs> I say in France, the, the, the main uh, political competition is no longer like it, like it has been for decades between the left and the right. It is between, sorry, it is between the extreme right in the opposition and the extreme right in power. It is between the extreme right in the opposition, Marine Le Pen, and the extreme right in power, Darmanin, who has recently said to Marine Le Pen, hey, hey, when it comes to Islamism, I think you're not really tough. I'm doing better than you. So we have a competition. And now what is the um, most recent phase of this competition? It came in the, uh, it came, uh, in the frame of a, a book being published, just like the, the previous stage. The previous stage was a book by Bernard Rougier, the, the lost territories of Islamism, you know, when Islamism is, uh, is uh, moving in our cities. Uh, this book was uh, the networks of the Frerist, of the Ikhwan Muslimin, okay? Nothing new in this book, absolutely nothing new in this book. But it has implemented, it has cautioned, it has supported the move of the government. The move of the government, which I mentioned uh, uh, late 2020, it was a discourse by the President de la République in a small city, Les Mureaux. What did the President say in Les Mureaux? Listen to me carefully. We used to, the French government used to repress, criminalize the acts, the actions of a minority of Muslims. Since 2020, he has started criminalizing, repressing, not the actions, the opinions, not of a minority, of a majority of Muslim citizens. This is the situation where we have moved. So this last book by Bergeau Blacker, and I will conclude soon, this last book by Florence Bergeau Blacker, it's the only uh, time I will mention her name, as make it legal using the concept of atmosphere. You know, there is a jihadist and Keppel has explained us that jihadism is something, but the atmosphere of jihadism is much wider. The next step 
is moving from jihadism to frerism, ikhwan, brothers, Muslim, but it's not only the Muslim brothers which are to be uh, re-denounced, criminalized, it's the atmosphere. The atmosphere means that you do not repress only Muhammad, you repress also Murad and Fatih because they know Muhammad. They have seen him twice, you know? So the atmosphere, not of jihadism, not of the hardcore of, of, of the more or less radical uh, Muslim activists. No, no, no. The, the, the majority. We have moved into a situation when the majority of Muslims are legally criminalized. Now, to, to conclude, by a mention of the very issue of the panel. How do we criminalize those who struggle against Islamophobia? Allow me to, but I'm not, uh, I don't want to be considered as, a, as a, a center of the landscape, but just my personal experience. As soon as I started and I was, and maybe we'll have time to, uh, to, uh, to investigate, why is it that so few of the academic community has reacted uh, to this tendency because you know, social networks, it's for poor people. We have no um, cultural uh, uh, capital, um, but, but, but this affair has extended uh, far beyond uh, the uh, uh, social media. It has invaded 90% of the French mainstream press. Anyway, I was accused on prime time on TV by a major journalist. He said he has, he has hang a target in the back of his colleague. Uh, I, I, I became part, a, a member, a supporter of those who will kill her, just like Professor Samuel Paty has been slaughtered in a school in France. So this is the situation. We are, we are a minority, but this minority is prevented, is prohibited to react, to speak, because it is considered uh, uh, as fueling the death menace uh, against who, the, who, those who fuel the Islamophobia. Not to mention the fact that I receive daily very vicious death menace on my Twitter. I'm considered a collaborator. You don't know, I, I, I think you know what in French what collaborator means. It means those who have been the allied of the Nazis and who have been hanged and, 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 and killed by many different ways at the end of World War II. I'm sorry, I've probably been a, a little too long. I think we've left times for questions, but not only question, but to the testimony, slightly different, but uh, Farid is not an islamo -gauchist. So after the islamo you are go going to, to hear a representative of the Muslim civil society. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, excellent presentation. Farid, it's your turn. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Professor Esposito, um, for um, having this very meaningful and important event. I think um, it's it's uh, really important, especially for people you know outside, but even more so maybe for Europeans, <laughs> really to understand what is going on, um, as this uh, issue has not uh, uh, got the attention that it uh, deserves to have. Um, now, what I'm going to do um, with regard to uh, Dr. Bougar's um, presentation, I, I would like to give some sort of a larger context uh, to understand the specificity um, of the situation and then give a very more of a, a micro uh, a, a case study that I present. Uh, Professor Esposito has already mentioned that um, I was targeted as part of an operation, and I will speak about this very specific case because it really uh, very well shows us how um, how certain knowledge, academic knowledge production, or so-called academic knowledge production, becomes part and parcel of bureaucratic action and uh, governmental actions that uh, lead to the de facto criminalization of critical studies. Um, maybe in general, giving uh, the, the Austrian context, um, you know, Austria, other than, than France, um, has, it had its obviously also its colonial uh, encounter and it colonized uh, uh, the largest part, Bosnia and Herzegovina was uh, largely also a Muslim populated uh, 
a space that was colonized by the Austro-Hungarian monarchy. So there is uh, already a colonial encounter that is also then um, uh, again, many, many years later, um, after the end of the Second World War, and it's very interesting uh, um, accommodation of Islam, so to say, um, becomes again relevant. But other than France, what we have in Austria is that most of the immigrant Muslim population is not coming from former colonies. Um, the largest part is uh, the working poor coming from Turkey in the 1960s. And as a matter of fact, Austria, especially the way it presented itself to the outside world in terms of its soft power diplomacy of the foreign uh, foreign uh, administration, um, uh, one of the things that is crucial to Austria is it always prided itself of being very accommodating uh, towards Islam. You know, Austria had legally recognized Islam as one of today's 16 religions, uh, which is actually something quite unique in the Western European context. And for many, many decades, this was seen as something, even by the Muslims themselves, as something that actually makes Muslim life easy in Austria. But I think, again, there is something that uh, Dr. Bourga said that is very true, I think, not only for France and Austria, but really for on a global scale, which is, um, especially in the Western Hemisphere, that the problems that Muslims are currently going through is very much relating to the fact that we now have generations that demand equal equality before the law. And not only in theoretical terms, but practically speaking, because they are aware of what, how they ought to be treated as citizens. And I think this is also one of the explanations of why in recent years, and I would uh, start this uh, um, date, this uh, change of the Austrian policy versus vis-a-vis uh, -vis Muslims, really to the coming of power of Sebastian Kurz, a centrist right, politician to become first minister, uh, um, secretary of state in the Ministry of Interior, and then at the end, chancellor after he had to step down. Now, this happens in the context of a country that is very small, but that has become also, again, together with France, together with Denmark, a leading power within the European Union to basically push towards a policy that has is much more uh, character can be characterized as very hawkish vis-a-vis -vis its domestic Muslim population. Um, now, one of the means um, that um, Austria took, and I, I will share here a PowerPoint presentation um, to make this all of this uh, much more visible to you. Um, <clears throat> One of the means to argue for the criminalization of Islamophobia studies was framing it as some sort of political Islam. And I would like to make a differentiation here. Usually when we think about um, Islamophobia, we think about the far right, which is blatantly Islamophobic, right? It says, we don't want Muslims in our European countries. But what the centrist right and some centrist left politicians did was to say, well, actually, we are trying to defend the large majority of Muslims against a few bad ones. And the few bad ones got a name. Like in France, they were called Islamist separatism, fairism, and all of that. In Austria, they were called political Islam, like members of political Islam. Um, so the case study that I'm presenting here is very much drawing on an article that should be soon uh, out soon, which is called Criminalizing Political Scholarship, Austria's Intelligence Service in Islamophobia Studies, which is part of a volume uh, called Dis Disentangling Jihad, Political Violence and Media. Um, the fight against political Islam, and this is really what is at stake here, is something that the Austrian government um, did and what was uh, what we saw not only in Austria, also in France under a different name, Islamist separatism in Germany was called legalistic Islamism. And there are different notions in different places, but they all of them, and this is what I've shown in these two articles, if you're more interested in that, 
all of these notions and, and the discourse around it aims basically at three very specific aspects of Muslim life. First of all, it aims to exclude Muslims from the public sphere. So in a way, it tries to reduce Muslim visibility. Secondly, it, it works against non-governmental Muslims. And that is a crucial aspect here, because even if you look at the French example of uh, uh, President Emmanuel Macron, one of the things that he did while fighting Islamist separatism, he had his good Muslim folks and uh, those structures that were actually created by the Ministry of Interior itself that would represent the good Muslims, right? So it's not about all organized Muslims. It's, it's, uh, it's against being against those Muslims who are organized and are not affiliated to state institutions. All right, so it's the destruction of non-governmental Muslim civil society. <clears throat> and third, and this is very much what this whole case study about Islamophobia studies is all about, it's about the silencing of critical voices within the Muslim communities. So basically all the Muslims who become collaborators um, of the state institutions, they are welcomed, they are embraced, they are <clears throat> celebrated, <clears throat> pardon me, and those Muslims who are critiquing the state institutions and the Islamophobic policies, the discrimination, they are the ones who then are framed as being part and parcel of so-called political Islam. And this is actually what I have shown in these two articles. One is in German and one is in English, where and the English one especially looks at, uh, from a comparative perspective, at Austria, Germany, and France as three different cases. <clears throat> um, so Professor Esposito already mentioned the Operation Luxor. Operation Luxor, what was in November 2020, um, a police operation arrayed against 70 people and institutions that the, uh, who were <clears throat> said to be part of a terrorist organization, of a criminal organization, uh, of what is called a state enemy organization, Staatsfeindliche Organisation in, in, in German. Um, terrorism finance and money laundering. So these were the five legal reasons why they uh, entered the private sphere of a lot of people, including myself. Um, the rhetoric of the Minister of Interior, who is now the Chancellor of Austria, was that they would, quote unquote, cut off the roots of political Islam. So this is what the political aim, basically, of this operation was. Um, once they had raided the houses, they also interrogated the people that they uh, that uh, became the defendants in this case, and they asked them a lot of questions. Um, amongst those questions were also questions in regards to Islamophobia. What one of the question was, what do you think about the term Islamophobia? Is it justified? Or is it that Muslims, because of the oppression of women and the terrorism that emanates from Muslims, is the reason why people are suspicious of Muslims, right? So you can see clearly see how the intelligence service really thinks about this whole theme that we are discussing here today. Now, I would like, you know, coming with that this example, what I would like to do now is basically show how could it happen that the intelligence service thinks the way he does. And what I will do now is basically trace the evolution of academic knowledge production that laid the basis for that kind of thought. And I would like to start with an example of one of the scholars who is often mentioned in, and he's all, often an advisor to many of these uh, institutions that are uh, surveilling Muslims and criminalizing Muslims, as I would call it, which is in this case, the Documentation Center Political Islam, as it was established in June 2020 in Austria. Uh, the person here is one of the advisors, Lorenzo Vidino, who is based at George Washington University in DC. And in one of the interviews that he gave to a German uh, daily newspaper, the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, um, he was asked, what is, what is more dangerous? Is it jihadism? Is it like weaponized violence in the name of Islam? Or is it political Islam? And the answer that he gave, I think is very, uh, very telling. 
What he said is, it is difficult to compare the two because they are two different forms of threats. But if I had to choose, I would say that political Islam, which is also called legalistic Islamism, speaking to a German audience, is the greater threat. So now the question is, how comes that some scholars um, believe that it is not violence that is threatening, but people that are, are representing a certain idea of how a political social order should look like, political Islam. Now going back here, he was also the author for the Austrian intelligence service in 2017 of a report called the Muslim Brotherhood in Austria. And I will not go into detail here, but I will just speak about one aspect which I think is crucial for understanding the evolution um, of the criminalization of Islamophobia studies. What he says in this, in this report, and that's a, a little bit of a, a, of a longer uh, quote, but I think it's important um, to really go through that. He says, drawing on some anti-Muslim incidents and attitudes that unquestionably exist, European Brotherhood organizations in a similar fashion to their counterparts throughout the West <clears throat> have purposely exaggerated them and tried to foster a siege mentality within mo local Muslim communities. So what he basically does is he says, well, Islamophobia exists, but these people are exaggerating the amount and the existence of Islamophobia, right? Um, and he continues, he says, this dynamic has been particularly evident in Austria over the last few years as brotherhood linked entities have used the charge of Islamophobia with abundance, leveraging it at times with good reason, but in many cases without um, any uh, foundations and for calculated strategic reasons and the combination of um, of these two elements can potentially be explosive. So he, he basically argues there is a strategic calculation behind it to intentionally use uh, talking about Islamophobia to problematize um, um, Muslim existence. And here comes the interesting part. The combination of these two elements can potentially be explosive if Muslims in, Ga in Gaza, in Palestine, have the right to defend themselves and their use of violence is actually a divinely sanctioned jihad, one can argue why not also in the West, where according to what the brothers say, they are also under attack. So basically what he is saying here is critiquing Islamophobia amounts to a form of an intellectual jihad. And you know, everybody who studies Islamophobia knows all of these different terms, love jihad in India, judicial jihad if Muslims defend themselves in front of the court. Now, every, every, every mundane act of a Muslim becomes reframed as an act of jihad, hitherto as an act of violence. And I think this is re really important and also very much connects to what uh, Dr. Boga said, uh, where he said, it's not any more acts that are targeted. It's the thinking, it's the opinion, right? So critiquing something in the public space as a scholar or as, or as an NGO becomes an act of violence or even worse than violence itself, as Vidino said in the other quote of the Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung. These are some of the questions then what the, what the intelligence service, once they did the Operation Luxor and brought the defendants to the police station, what they asked those defendants, they said, what do you understand by the term Islamophobia? In your opinion, is the term justified? If so, please explain why um, and, to what, and what do you understand by this term? Are Muslims suppressed in Austria? Is Islamist global terrorism possibly the reason for fears emanating from Islam, or is the oppression equally, especially of women or people of other faiths, by the norms of the Sharia? May your son marry a Christian, unbeliever, blah, blah, blah. I mean, there are thousands of uh, questions asked, but this, these uh, questions that are highlighted in red, they really tell you how the intelligence service looks at um, um, at uh, Islamophobia. And the interesting thing is that at the very same time, like years ago, before that happened, the intelligence service would even have a category of Islamophobia as hate crime, because 
Austria is a member of the European Union. It's a member of the OSCE, right? So there are there is a hate crime uh, and uh, and discrimination legislation. There is there is also a data um, that that is collected and so on and so forth. So Islamophobia is not like something that was criminalized before, but that really changed with these scholars coming. Uh, um, entering the space and try and informing the intelligence service with a new way of thinking. Reed, I would yeah. just note the last st uh, statement. Do you and your wife and your kids observe the prayer times? You really think about how non-militant that is, but how that then gets weaponized. I just Absolutely. want to point that out. Absolutely. And th this really also showcases, you know, the first analytical category where I said like, every expression of Muslimness is potentially criminalized, right? Mm. So there is no differentiation anymore between any acts of violence and any sort of religious, uh, religious acts. So what these uh, scholars then did, and, and here I have, um, what I show you here is from the search warrant that was handed over to me after my house was raided. This is the original uh, uh, German. And this is what just a part of it uh, in the English translation, what the intelligence service also said in its report about, about me, as, as John uh, Esposito just had uh, um, introduced me, I am the editor of the European Islamophobia report. I'm publishing continuously. I was at the University of Salzburg for seven years before I took exile in the United States. Um, and I have always been working on Islamophobia, right? So, you know, at that point, um, the Secret Service basically collected a lot of my, my writing and then came to the conclusion where he said, and this is, uh, this is from one of the Secret uh, Service's uh, reports about my person in this investigation of Operation Luxor, like half a year or a year after my house was raided, where they say Islamophobia thus turns out to be a combat term Kampfbegriff in German, that is consistently used to deflect criticism of Islam or of problems in human rights violations within Muslim communities and to label them as anti-Muslim racism. As a result, critics and other serious scholars and journalists are denounced, denounced as Islamophobic in the 2016 European Islamophobia report, putting them in the same corner as right-wing populists, right-wing radicals, and racists. So basically what they are saying here is um, and uh, is that any kind of critique deflects reasonable criticism of Muslims living wherever they live, in Austria and around the world. And they are criticizing me for ba basically equating, that's how they read it at least, equating those critics of Islam as they present themselves with the far right. And again, this is coming from the power structures, right? From the intelligence service, not from the fringe far right. So as a matter of fact, what happened was that when I appealed against, against the raid and everything, the regional court in the first instance issued a decision where they upheld the investigation against me. And in that uh, decision, the regional court said as follows, activities in the preparation of the so-called Islamophobia report and his activity, speaking of me, like Farid's activity with the Bridge Initiative at Georgetown University is intended to, to disseminate the fighting term Islamophobia with the goal of preventing any critical engagement with Islam as a religion in order to establish an Islamic state. So basically, any kind of academic work criticizing Islamophobia becomes a means to create the worldwide caliphate. And therefore, because ISIS wants a caliphate and I don't know whatever political Islam wants a caliphate, it is basically putting all of them in the same pot saying, well, you are all terrorists. And whereas there is no violent act that can ever be characterized as being against, as offending any criminal law, you become part and parcel of a terrorist organization that wants to create this worldwide terrorist caliphate. And this is 
basically how they then argue and legitimize their cracking down on a, a scholar like myself. And you know that had real life consequences, like my, my, my assets were frozen, my bank account was frozen, et cetera, et cetera. Like my whole reputation was, try they tried to destroy it. Uh, gladly, I had a lot of colleagues also that spoke out of, on behalf of me, including Professor Esposito and Dr. Boga and many others. But you know that was basically the the attempt uh, the, the the attempt and and, and uh, the way of how they tried to silence a critical voice that never uh, never really succumbed to their uh, to their to their pressure. Finally, as Professor Esposito also said, this case was closed, and also the the appellate court ruled that all of this was nonsense, as it is obviously. But nevertheless, it really shows us one important thing, which is like. In the in the in the course of the war on terror, the institutionalization of so-called countering violent extremism really expanded to countering non-violent extremism. So what what happened and what we can see with this case is that, again, as Dr. Bogart showed in the in the case of France, it is not acts that are targeted. It is really the thinking, the opinion that is targeted. It is thought that is targeted. And what that does implicitly is also expanding the notion of terrorism itself, right? So terrorism would not only include violent acts, but it would also include thinking, opinions, critique that is happening in, 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 in the civil space. And that is why I would uh, like to end with a quote from Edward Said, which he wrote in the late 1980s, where he analyzed a different case. But I think it really speaks so much also to what we are uh, going through in Europe, which is uh, where he says the problem is that the use of the word terrorism was a political weapon designed to protect the strong. And I think this is really what we are seeing. It is the white dominant society that does not want to have equal citizenship for Muslims in Europe, that is using the notion of terrorism, of violence, of jihad, of political Islam, Islamist separatism, and so on and so forth, really to protect its privileges, exclude the Muslims who demand their equal rights, to marginalize them and to not allow them to participate as anybody else is legally able to participate. So I would like to stop um, to end with these words and I'm very much looking forward to having a fruitful discussion. Thank you. That last quote was very good. When you get a chance, send me um, the, the citation because it, it's, it's spot on. Um, Okay, why don't we, I'm going to just give, uh, I have a number of, of discussion questions. I'm just going to give maybe start with two, but then I want to go to people who are uh, looking and then we can come back if there's time uh, to what we'll be talking about. In, in France, and this has come up in, in the presentation, there's been a popularization of the term Islamo-leftism leveled by politicians against academics who call attention to state Islamophobia. How, it's not just the, the question of elaborating on this on this term and how it's being used by officials, uh, because I think we've, we've touched on that a bit, but at this stage of the game, um, how, how dangerous do you, do you see that? And I, when I ask some of my questions, it's not that I may not hold a certain position. It's just that I want to get it on the, on the table. In other words, how, how dangerous and significant is it? Because for some of us, it is very dangerous and significant. But in terms of the society itself and the extent to which the society itself, that is, the haves in the society, uh, you know, feel, feel threatened, it, that's that that that's an issue. Would this be a question to me? Yeah. Yeah. I'm the French. Huh? Uh, uh, well, uh, throughout this seminar, well, just just a, a quick reaction to what said Far, uh, Farid. Uh, I seem so close to what has been said. 
I mean, I could have uh, expressed it in, in, in exactly the same terminology. So there is a, a French specificity, but the core of your analysis uh, fully exactly fits into what I, I feel in France. Now, I, I will be most of the time a pessimist in, in this webinar. Allow me to be optimistic for a few seconds. When it comes to islamo uh, the Minister of um, Higher Education uh, a couple of years ago supposedly asked to CNRS, National Center for Scientific Research and University, to make an inquiry into the which extent this moral cancer has degenerated the university. And the CNRS, they looked uh, in the face of their superior, their minister, and they said, you know, uh, something very rude. <laughs> in Arabic, you say, tozfik, yani, disappear. This question is stupid. Mrs. Minister, we are not going to respond to a question which has absolutely no scientific base. This, this is the way they express themselves. So this is the good part of the message. 90% of the academic uh, uh, corps is, uh, is sane, is, is functioning, is respectful. The problem in France, it's not the academics, it's the fact that a tiny fringe of the academic, let's mention him at least once, Gilles Keppel, Bernard mm. Rouget, and their last followers. They are the inheritors of uh, Bernard Lewy school, maybe in the US, those who blame Islam mm, for everything. Uh, they are those who are in the media on prime time. By, by the time that 90% of the production of the academy is not available in the media. So this is the problem. This is the problem. And, and to, to address uh, the, the, the very issue of the question. Yes, 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 the situation is bad because the public opinion is not supportive of 90% of the academy. The voice of 90% of the academy has no influence on, on public opinion. And those who have uh, influence, they are the tiny uh, fringe which uh, support this competition of extreme rights uh, sur le dos of the French Muslims. But an irony here is that, and I agree with you, is that in, in, in France and in a number of countries, as, as you pointed out, and, and, and what, that's, what does make it dangerous is that you wind up with government and, and often it's agencies uh, that do have power and, and cling to this kind of ideology. So, for example, in the United States, certainly a, a clear time when there was a big issue was during the Trump administration. Whether you were talking about domestic policy or foreign policy, it was clear that that was an issue. The Biden administration has tried to respond to that, but, but in, as far as I'm concerned, in a rather tepid fashion. Finally, it did have a statement recently. The president had a statement on Islamophobia, but it's not as if we see government as so far showing muscle the way it does in dealing and being concerned about anti-Semitism. Now, maybe they'll rise to that. But if, in fact, we have, you know, uh, you know, uh, countries in Europe, yeah, as well as, uh, as the U.S., where governments involved, um, then um, that, that's the real problem, you know, I mean, in terms of because they, they, they have power in certain areas that we, we cannot, uh, you know, we cannot touch. John, uh, allow me a, a technical question. I have noticed that we have in the, in the audience Suel Shisha. You know, uh, like I do, that for some reasons he, he's not been involved in the panel. I don't mm. know if it is technically possible to hear the sound of his voice. If sure, it's not, we should be able to. Salam, and thank you for, uh, uh, Francois, thank you for sharing with me your time. And thank you, uh, uh, Professor Esposito, uh, for this organization. And also thank you, Farid, for your very, uh, uh, very uh, great uh, expose. So I would like uh, during this my brief interview to give you an example, not of a state repression, uh, but an experience of the repression by the society, uh, society through its mass media. So it allows also to enlarge the scope of fighting Islamophobia uh, to the intellectual public debate or sport or culture. So I've been targeted not as a scholar, 
uh, studying Islamophobia, but as an intellectual, uh, uh, as a public intellectual. Uh, not as a Muslim thinker, but as a rationalized Muslim who thinks and who he thinks uh, in a critical way. So uh, I experienced an intense campaign of delegitimation and criminalization depicted as a symbol of Islamist obscurantism. And, uh, but my work, and uh, to explain that notion of rationalized, my work is not that much uh, on uh, Islamophobia, but in, on an anthropology of whiteness. But as I'm from a Muslim background, I've been uh, depicted as a terrorist and a radical thinker. My case was not that, uh, I mean, I had some issues with the state, but not that much as they discovered that I had no political power, but as I was a voice in the public debate, it was not necessary for the state to intervene. Ra racist intellectuals and the mass media, uh, um, uh, that was enough uh, to, uh, to silence me. And uh, this is to say that uh, it is a, a minimalization uh, to believe that, uh, or to think uh, to Islamophobia as an expression of the state. It is an expression of society and therefore including the state. The state is not independent from the society. Islamophobia is also on the academic uh, uh, field, which is very often forgotten. And uh, though Farid gave a good example of it. So uh, there is many ways uh, to silence Muslim people. Mine was to intensively criticize me and then uh, there is nothing. I mean, uh, I was cut in my career. I mean, I was expelled from the Belgian Academy soon before passing my PhD. Never uh, uh, succeed in funding it. So uh, this is a kind of relegation as I'm at the margin of the, of the academia. And this is of course a lack of uh, symbolic capital when, when you intervene in the public debate. So uh, my point here is uh, that uh, th there are um, different ways, ways of, uh, uh, of for Islamophobia to express uh, itself. And we don't have to forget uh, that, and I certainly agree with, uh, uh, with Farid and, and Francois, Islamophobia is a tool of whiteness to protect his privileges and the main space of legitimation of Islamophobia is academia. So uh, we, it is important not to forget academia. It is important not to forget the civil society and of course to articulate them uh, as a legitimation of the state. Yeah, thank you Francois for uh, those uh, precious minutes and a rare opportunity you, I have to public myself, uh, to express you, myself. Okay, yeah, well, I'm, I'm not going to be longer. No, thank you very much for, uh, for, for those comments. I, I think that they, they very much uh, concretize uh, and, and add and bring um, a, 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 another perspective uh, to this issue. Um, Andrew, why don't we go with the questions that we have uh, and then I can always come back to some of the questions, the other questions that are here if we still have time. So the first question in the Q&A, we have from uh, Sue Elman uh, Chembia. Um, the question is, immigration affected the entire uh, continent of Europe. Muslims are now demanding for rights and equality, yet are being denied by the sons and daughters of colonizers. Could we say that the French context is a representative of the entire Europe? And if not, where and what are the exceptions? In your opinion, do you envision an end to these struggles? Do I take this one? Yep. Um, and, and Farid will also uh, uh, complete. Um, if I was um, to um, underline the French touch, which I started uh, raising at the beginning, I would say, yes, there is a clear border. We, we are doing the worst. We are the worst. <laughs> but uh, 
to address the question, yes, I do consider that we are the front line of a process which is going throughout Europe in, in approximately the same speed. If I was to, uh, to mention uh, exceptions, I would say the situation is not that bad in Spain as it is in Italy. Uh, it is not as bad in Portugal as it is in France. But, but uh, we are going in the same direction. Now, if I was to mention a clear this French touch, I would say we, the French, um, as I said, have expelled, have refused the legitimacy of, of the religious sphere, of the religion in the public sphere. This has had very uh, concrete, specific consequences. When the British, when the Americans, when the Canadians, found themselves in front of a lady wearing a hijab or of a Sikh with a beard and a turban asking, may I be a civil servant in your society? They, mm -mm -mm -mm, they said, yes. We, the French, we said, no. This is a huge difference. The French criminalize uh, the, the, mere, um, the mere expression of um, uh, religious belonging in the public sphere. So if you wear hijab, don't you enter a school? Uh, it, it's, it's much more vicious than this. And this will reconnect with the social ground of my demonstration. If you are cleaning a room, you can wear a hijab. But don't you wear a hijab if you want to be an attorney or a professor. This is the real rule. This is the real rule. In fact, we don't care about the, the, the guy doing the cleaning if he has a bird, it's okay. But if he enters in, in the uh, bourgeoisie level uh, of action, he is uh, prohibited to exist. So this is a French specificity, indeed. This is the worst. If I was to, to wrap up uh, at an analytical level the position of the French, we do not consider that the religious belonging can go along any kind of political modernization. See, when we have, when, when we, the French, have looked toward the, uh, South America and see the Théologie de la Libération, hmm? Liberation's Theology, we have seen Christians doing something positive in the field of politics, and we have accepted it, except that we do not accept the same, the same uh, uh, alchemy. Uh, when it comes to Muslims. Muslims, if they want to be good, they must get rid of their religion. And this is, this is a specificity of the French. The, 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 the issue is slightly different in the US, I will let you say it, and slightly different in the UK. Because in the UK, uh, when you had, in Canada, when you had racial tensions with Muslims, hmm, uh, and in Australia as well, the Canadian government said, oh, I want to have Muslims visible in the core of, of, of uh, uh, the uh, uh, Canadian identity. Therefore, I'm going to ask ladies wearing hijab to ride horses in the Gendarmerie Nationale. Mm -hmm. In Australia, remember, this is not so well known. In 2005, they had riots, kind of racial riots against the Libs. The Libs is the equivalent of uh, uh, bad Arabs in, 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 in French uh, language. Uh, they had racial tensions on beaches in Australia. They decided that they would have ladies, Muslims, openly participate in the core of the Australian identity. What is the core of the Australian identity? Lifesavers. Life rescuers, mm -hmm. people swimming to help those who get drowned. Okay, so they ask ladies, women to be part of these teams. The, la the, the Muslim woman said, <clears throat> We have a problem with the bathing suit. Never, no problem. We will create the so called burkini, the, the, the extended uh, bathing suit. This was the reaction of the Australian authorities in 2005. The French would do exactly the opposite. So this is, and I'm, I, I do regret to have to say, so this is our specificity. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, if I may add something here, um, I think, you know, although I, I do share the idea that um, 
the articulation and the rhetoric is very different. I think, as we also have shown, the, the structural aspects behind it is very, is very similar. Much similar. So the question that I think is important here to raise is like, you know, if, if you, <clears throat> let's say, because Fra France is such a unique <clears throat> case in terms of the whole idea of uh, laicite, um, we have very similar measures in many different other European countries, but the rhetorical tool is exactly the opposite. Let's say, for instance, the hijab that was mentioned so often here, like, Yes, the French will argue we have no place for religion. That's why we're going to exclude the hijab. While most other European countries uh, on the con and and I I would say the dividing line is here really the UK and the rest of Europe, uh, because the UK is more Anglo-Saxon in its tradition and with its colonialism has a different pattern of the inclusion of the po of the post-colonial. But in the on the European continent, what we find is then the where where we have religious freedom being much more uh, and states being much more accommodating to religious uh, visibility the idea then to ban the hijab is not to argue we ban religion but to argue we ban political islam right like in many of in germany austria many other places where you had a hijab ban for teachers for civil servants etc they always drew on this idea of uh, the hijab is not actually religion we define religion in a different way, and we say this is a symbol of political Islam. So it's basically the bad, the, the bad version of Islam that I had explained before. Um, so, so I think that is one, one crucial aspect. And maybe also to add another dimension, because we have been speaking now about two very specific cases, France and Austria. And I think there is one interesting reason as to why these two countries have been so hostile in the more recent years towards its Muslim communities. And I believe one of the one among many aspects, but I think a crucial aspect of why this is the case is because these two countries have the highest percentage of Muslim folks living there. We're speaking yeah. in France of around approximately 9% and similar in Austria, eight to 9% of the whole population. So this question that uh, uh, François Bogas uh, raised at the very beginning of, you know, now we have a generation of Muslims that are demanding equal rights. That is the case not for two or three percent. That is the case for people who represent nearly a tenth of the whole population. And what what the uh, greatest nightmare in the imagination of so many Europeans is looking at London looking at the Muslim mayor, looking at places where religion is accommodated and where Muslims do have, to a much larger extent, the right of participation. I'm not saying, I'm not idealizing the UK, but this is exactly what they are fearing. And this is what they are holding back in defending their privileges. Yeah, if I, if I can just add a little uh, precision or uh, add another argument. Yeah, so uh, spe especially about France, um, there is here a very subtle uh, dynamics that is not really about Muslims as believer, but Muslims as a rationalized category. And it's a paradoxal adjunction as people are rationalized as Muslim. What does that mean? Is that whatever your belief and whatever your practice of religion, as soon as you can be linked to Islam, you are a Muslim. And in the same way, there is a strong consensus saying, well, there is no room for religion in the public debate. So you are rationalized as a religious and you are forbidden from being visible and part of the, polit of the public debate as a Muslim. That is the, a very subtle way to protect the social order. Another reason I believe, in addition to those uh, uh, just put on the table by Farid, is that in France, as well in Austria, there is a strong crisis of the state. The state is weakened with the, dis the uh, uh, disappearing of the historic historical political forces that had uh, been at power since World War II. And um, 
uh, Islamophobia that I prefer to label anti-Muslim racism is the only uh, strong social consensus today. It's the easier way to uh, create a consensus and to create or to uh, 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 to fuel a political forces and power. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, all of you. Um, uh, Andrew, maybe the next question, please. Yes, yeah, so we do have some more questions. Um, so if anyone does have a question, please put it into the Q&A. So we have a couple of questions here that are related, so I'm going to combine a couple of two. One question is from an anonymous attendee. Uh, the attendee um, is talking about how uh, the study of Islamophobia is being predominantly carried out uh, in the West um, to create frameworks on understanding it. Uh, they were wondering, have uh, you as experts noticed similar developments in the global South and the Middle East? And do you feel that the methods of Islamophobia are occurring in countries such as India, Bangladesh, and China? What advice would you give to anyone interested in studying Islamophobia in these countries? A, a, brief, uh, a brief response. Um, of course, we have not mentioned the, the fact that Islamophobia is an issue in China and it is an issue in, in India nowadays. Uh, when, when it comes to academic production, I have a piece of uh, mere information <laughs> to give you. Uh, I, I, was, I, I met in Turkey uh, a colleague by the name, um, oh, I will mention him, Irfan Ahmad, who is uh, an Indian. And he said, Francois, I've read your work and um, we have things to do together. Um, I am producing my own conceptual uh, production of Islamophobia in the frame of India and, and Indo-Pakistanis uh, relation. I have produced an essay, and I, I will put this uh, essay somewhere in the, your Facebook page uh, later on. And I want us uh, to, um, uh, to confront our conceptual approach of the phenomenon. So yes, indeed, there is room for producing uh, uh, academic material on Islamophobia in, in, in the frame of India and China. I, I would not step in. I don't feel I'm capable of, but I know that it is important. There's a lot of work to do. If you, if you allow me to, to just put one point, uh, be, um, no, two, two small points uh, to, to Farid. You mentioned the uh, Lorenzo Bidino, okay? So we should have a collection of these Lorenzo Bidinos. Uh, they exist, uh, uh, except that uh, he has a specificity. He is not a Muslim. We have uh, Ahmed Bidinos also, hmm? yeah. which we uh, ought to conceptualize because in the Muslim sphere, you have uh, these uh, archetypes. I don't know if you've heard about Basam TV, you, you probably met Basam oh, TV yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> in the German phone world, but yes. we, we have the same categories. We have the same categories. They have to be constructed because they are instrumentalized and they are on prime time TV in my country uh, all the time. I want to add one point, uh, which I opened my, my paper with when I mentioned the uh, foreign influence of the Israeli uh, Zionist lobby on, on, the, um, on the issue of criminalizing uh, Muslims who raise their voice, okay? Um, we, need, we need to add the fact, and, and when it comes to the terminology political Islam, let's, let, let, let me put it this way. In, in 2019, we had the visit in Paris of uh, 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 Mohammed Isa, I, I think is his name, is the Secretary General of the World Islamic League. Okay, we also had the visit of Abdel Fattah CC, mm? and and the same discourse they gave to the the French authorities was, we are here to help you struggle against against what, uh, jihadism, terrorism, uh, fundamentalism, no 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 no, political Islam. Political Islam. This is the terminology they used in October 2019. Abdel Fattah Sisi wanted to help the French struggle against political Islam. So we have a regional dimension. The, 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 the demands by the uh, Arabs autocrats and the Israelis to criminalize oppositions and resistance are part of the landscape. They file the European 
uh, Islamophobia and they fuel the European Islamophobia and they fund they, the Emirates, which are the, the heroes of this uh, Arab counter revolution, uh, foiling Islamophobia, are spending billions of dollars fueling fake think tanks, uh, fake opposition press, criminalizing uh, the country which is uh, supposedly supportive of Ikhwan and Muslimin. So this has to be part of the landscape. This regional dimension, I think, is not the hardcore. The core we have mentioned many times. It's the, 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 the colonizers refusing the, 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 the coming back of the uh, colonisé. But these uh, conjuncturally allies of this process are important to mention. And I'm glad you allowed me to uh, do it. Uh, one quick point. Um, the center is has a move towards uh, in, in, in in the last year, at least, to dealing with the globalization of Islamophobia in India, uh, in China, in Myanmar. Um, and uh, I did a piece for Middle East Eye. It, it came out of a conference talk that I, I did in Istanbul, in which I talk about globalization of Islam. And, and what I add there is not just the globalization with China and Burma, et cetera, but the Arab world. And so countries like Egypt and countries like the UAE, uh -huh. Uh, in effect, either use the word political Islam or Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, and that becomes, uh, you know, th that's become more and more uh, a way to legitimate the suppression of really any kind of significant uh, alternative, uh, 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 you know, it, 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 it Islam, as it were, uh, not only in politics, but, but in society. And, and I think that we need to emphasize that a lot more. You know, we, we don't look at that. They, and they find it appealing. European countries find it very appealing, or even or even the Americans when when they hear that kind of discourse. Of course. Yeah. And, Andrew, uh, oh, go, yeah. go ahead, three. Oh, please. Yeah, I mean, just like two very short uh, comments on that. I mean, I very much agree, and I have also shared in the webinar chat uh, one of my latest articles where I speak about this um, <clears throat> this transnational. Um, um kind of dialogue and and cooperation and you i mean even you know when i spoke about the operation luxor i mean think about the name luxor right it comes from a specific country <laughs> right uh, so and that is not by chance i mean there is cooperation here between intelligence services that have certain assumptions about like what a civil society should look like um, um, a couple of uh, colleagues and we, we have published a book called Islamophobia and Muslim Majority Societies in 2019. And um, we looked at Islamophobia very much uh, from the perspective of uh, the post-colonial uh, state uh, making and how uh, the post-colonial political elites uh, in, a, in a sort also of you know, a cultural inferiority complex tried uh, to become, to model around the Westphalian nation state and try to produce uh, nations that are working along uh, European perspectives of how a society should look like. Um, and I think it's not uh, it's not by chance. Again, if you look, we have taught, we have mentioned many uh, in many ways um, the hijab here. But again, think about where the hijab was first banned. You have Tunisia as a Muslim majority country yeah. that was colonized by the French. And that um, um, is, is, is very much also embedded in this very specific French secularist worldview. Um, and I think that explains a lot in terms of like how Islamophobia is also a cultural and political pillar in those societies. And more so, I think even uh, in terms not only of the criminalization of so-called political Islam, but very much also in terms of the control of religious institutions by the state. And I think that's a very crucial aspect here because these very often authoritarian regimes have a different understanding of how of what place a religion should have and in religious inst institutions. So they are basically the long arm of the state. And when Western European uh, countries 
embrace that kind of discourse, embrace that kind of also institutional pattern of how to uh, include Muslims and create spaces for Muslims, it's along these authoritarian lines. And this is this uh, implies a very, very important and dangerous potential, which is the import of these sort of structures in European public spaces where the state owns the religion and uses the religion for his own sake. So that's a completely different understanding compared to how in Western European societies, uh, usually Catholic Protestant uh, majority churches are regulated. And that will have also an implication in the short and long term, uh, in, the mid, uh, in, in the long term um, for the larger societies, I believe. Okay, Andrew, another yes. question. Yep, we definitely have some time for more questions. Okay, so our next question is actually from uh, um, one of our uh, former uh, academics here at the center, uh, Nahid Afroz uh, Kabir. Uh, Nahid asks, to what extent uh, does Islamophobia, or to what extent is Islamophobia found in French and Austrian schools within, edu within or amongst educated <laughs> students? I think we start with Austria, don't we? We can, I mean, you know, I mean, just to give you like a few examples, I think, though we have the United Nations now um, uh, supported, uh, like uh, decided on a resolution in the fight against Islamophobia, which every member state uh, supported, including France and Austria. Uh, <laughs> that does not tell us anything about, you know, how, th how people think about the problem. And there is largely, uh, a negligence of, of, of the mere existence of Islamophobia. Um, so you will see in the educational space very often, let's say, as part and parcel of the countering violent extremism programs, that, for instance, you will find teachers saying, oh, after the summer holidays, you know, my, my student came with a, wearing a hijab. So I should, I should uh, go to a documentation center to report some radical features of this student. Mm -hmm. Things like that happen. Mm -hmm. um, but even more than that, I think that, you know, and going even beyond the problem of anti-Muslim racism, even racism itself, and that's the problem of a lot of countries like France and Austria and a lot of European continental countries. Not only do you have a denial of Islamophobia, you also have a denial of racism itself. Like the whole crusade of the French governmental elite was not against uh, uh, Islamo-Gushism, Islamo-Leftism. It was against critical race theory, gender studies, post-colonial studies, any kind of critical studies. And very much the same is, is true that in a lot of European countries, all of these sub-disciplines that are critical towards their societies uh, from a post-colonial perspective, they these disciplines, these traditions don't have any kind of institutional home in those countries. Um, and therefore, because of the non-existence of these academic critical spaces, you can imagine what that means for the teachers who are trained at the universities of how they think about these issues and to what extent they are fed by the knowledge production that comes from the established scholars like Gilles Kepel in France and, and other folks in Austria and, and other world and at other places, versus you know having critical scholarship that is really at the margin also uh, in the university space. Yeah. Um, if, if I can add something and this time to focus not on um, universities and academia, but uh, a basic school and secondary stage of education. As we know from sociology, from Bourdieu, uh, education schools are the most important tool of social reproduction. And therefore here in this case, also a field of inferiorization, I repeat, not of Muslims, but of people rationalized as Muslim. That does not mean that uh, they're not Muslim, but they are um, uh, forced to a single identity that is fantasized. 
Uh, if you look to France, I'm speaking here only for France and by consequences, Belgium, the most, uh, the most regular debate about expressing Islamophobia is around school. You have uh, the issue of the veil that appeared in school. You have right after that, the assassination of uh, and the use the, instru the instrumental use, the Islamophobic, Islamophobic use of uh, the, the, the assassination uh, of Samuel Paty. We have right now in France a stupid and crazy debate about la abaya, the, the, mm -hmm. the way some students choose to wear. Uh, you have regular debate about uh, should or couldn't uh, the student take a day off uh, for l'aid. You have a debate about the uh, so-called bad uh, results of Muslimized or racialized students during the Ramadan and so far and so far. So the point here is that it's a cultural repression and uh, main part of it is through education from the early stage to uh, the academia. Um, the, the, the good side of um, addressing the issue after two brilliant colleagues is that uh, all I have to do is, uh, is uh, to uh, endorse uh, uh, most, uh, no, all of what they have said. I was uh, going to uh, address the issue of uh, Abaya. Uh, uh, um, school is not a battleground uh, for Islamophobia. I would say it's the main battleground. It's the main battleground to observe uh, the trends of the society, uh, of the Muslim civil society. It is true that Abayas have succeeded to hijab with the same idea of um, enhancing some cultural, more than religious, Abaya is not strictly speaking a religious uh, garment. Um, and uh, the, the, the very vicious, uh, uh, discourses which are produced in the mainstream uh, media on this issue. So yes, 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 indeed. Uh, education is uh, one of the main battleground now uh, to observe, to analyze, to deconstruct uh, the rays and the response to Islamophobia in France. Um, a, a brief uh, ex example of something I encountered in, in Munich in a closed session with, with people who had some background or experience, they were, they were professionals, um, uh, lawyers and, and some others. Um, the, the chair kept talking about the fact that, well, you know, Germany's open and Munich's open. And we, we, we have Italians who are accepted as citizens, but every time he would talk, he'd always say Italians. Not that they were a hyphenated yeah. German, you know, on and on and on. But to, to a great extent, he said, but there are some people who mm -hmm. they just can't adapt. Some groups, he was talking obviously about the Turks. Uh, they, they can't adapt to our, and we are so sensitive about democracy in our country. So what do we do about those people? Well, at the end of the session, they called a coffee break and there are 12 people and overwhelmingly, they all uh, asked for espresso. And so I took my espresso cup because I was about to leave and said, today espresso, tomorrow Turkish coffee. <laughs> and he walked me to the elevator and said, Professor, what a wonderful experience this has been. And, and I look forward to our being in contact in the future, which I knew <laughs> would not be the case. Uh, but I mean, the, that kind of cultural mentality that there's this special... and himself not recognizing it's not about the Turk you know you got the Italian and you see the Italian is Christian in some way even just Christian culturally and the Turk is Muslim you know uh you know culturally and that's what makes for that kind of outsider uh uh you know and the strange situation we've been talking about it but but one country you know that, that we didn't mention is Sweden you know we have a number of countries where you'd say you know the good news is, I remember somebody from Poland saying this, an expert one time, it's the same thing with Sweden. The good news is we don't have a lot of Muslims, but the bad news is we have strong Islamophobia. And, and, and that's where the, the, the discourse of government, et cetera, can have such a, a, an, an impact. Well, uh, our time is up. I can't believe we, we, we went so fast, but uh, Andrew, do you have one more question? And then we have to wrap do we, up. Yeah, do we have time? This is kind of a wrap up question. Um, 
All right, so we do have a question here from uh, an attendee that would like to remain anonymous. Um, the question is, how can the Bridge Initiative, and by extension, other academic settings that address Islamophobia, highlight this discourse and support research in other countries that are themselves being targeted by the local Islamophobia industry? Well, from Bridges' point of view, uh, we we do, and we're becoming even, I think, we could be even more aggressive uh, in um, in pulling in uh, authors from different countries. You know, we, we've had people from Australia, we've had people from a variety of places uh, who are there either in uh, in academia or are in, um, as it were, uh, social citizen organizations uh, that that have uh, contributed. Also, we uh, do conferences in different places. You know, uh, uh, that is, we do them virtually, but uh, also uh, in person. Uh, we did with the anniversary that Fareed was referring to, the UN sort of anniversary, March fifteenth, uh, etc. We put together a program, uh, actually, on the glo the globalization of Islamophobia, but but did it in Doha. And then I just came back recently from one that was done. Uh, by the uh, policy planning of, of the uh, Ministry uh, uh, of Foreign Affairs. Uh, and it was uh, a roundtable with people from uh, various parts, from Europe, uh, from the U.S., um, and also uh, from the Gulf, from the Gulf states, uh, discussing uh, Islamophobia and its impact. I mean, I think we're, we're very much at, at that stage. Uh, what we won't be doing, uh, I think, uh, I think, Things are going to be changing a bit because we we did even in the past some of us would would speak in China let's say um, and uh, and I had some of my 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 work published there uh, and I had two scholars who after I did the last visit uh, had translated the books uh, but they were not coming out they were not coming out and, and I think at the end of the day they were not coming out uh, whereas they they did come out before even though it took two years to get the permissions. So I, I, I think it's uh, there's, there's a, a sensitivity in, in, in some of the countries that didn't exist before. But I think that also in a number of these societies, you do have um, scholars and social activists that are addressing these issues. And therefore, one can uh, put them on, if you will, the international stage, e either through uh, conferences in person. But more and more, I really like the idea of the virtual because you can more easily involve people uh, uh, you know, in, in a regular way, you don't have to raise the amount of funds that's required if you're if you're bringing in a lot of people from overseas. Well, we'll bring this to a close, but I, I'd like to thank our speakers. This has been, from my point of view, uh, one of the most exciting of our of, of our programs. And um, you know, I look forward to uh, Andrew's uh, uh, developing uh, this uh, so that we can uh, uh, distribute it. Uh, you know, with a link as a video, et cetera, uh, distribute the, the program. And I hope we uh, can stay in touch. So thank you very much. Take care and thanks to the audience. Bye-bye.